بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing our program with the title "The Heaviest of Deeds," pertaining to actions in the chapters of manners, good manners, and the fiqh of good manners. Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said in the hadith, "أثقل شيء في الميزان يوم القيامة حسن الخلق." That from the heaviest of things, the heaviest of deeds. On the day of judgment, in your scale, will be good character. Today, the characteristics or the good manners that we are going to look at is the manners of visiting and hosting. So, the manners of the guest and the host. In the hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, wherein he mentioned that a man was on a journey, whether that journey was short or long, to visit. A friend of his. So on the way, an angel came to him and said to him, "Where are you going?" He said, "I'm on my way to visit a brother of mine, yani a brother in Islam." The angel asked him, "Does this person have anything to give you? Is there any benefit that he owes to you?" The man he said, "La, ghaira ani ahbabtu fi Allah azza wa jal." He said, "No." Except that I love him for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then the angel said, "Fa'lam inni Rasulullahi bi an Allah qad habbaka kama habbatahu fi." Then know for sure that I am a messenger from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to inform you that verily Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loves you as you have loved that person for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we see from this beautiful narration. That to visit your brothers and sisters in Islam is something which is tremendous and heavy in your scale of good deeds. It's something which is beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. It's something which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants to see. But this visiting and this meeting it has manners and mannerisms, as does most of the other things that we do in Islam. So there are times when we visit people that we are not supposed to visit them. Does anybody know those times? There are timings during the day that we are not supposed to visit. Exactly, this is one of the times during the mid-afternoon nap when the people like to have a mid-afternoon nap. Whenever, when, when apart from that, also the Fajr time, right? Around the Fajr time, when people have finished praying, they want to go back to bed, maybe, and also after Aisha, people want to go to bed. But these are not things that I, yani, culture to culture, it differs depending upon the norms of that culture. You have to keep that in mind. But what you'll find is that the message from these points is that you'll find it repeatedly mentioned, but in different ways. Is that the host has to be kind to the guest. And the guest has to be kind to the host. Neither of them burdening the other or making life difficult for the other. What is the ruling of accepting an invitation? What is the hukum of of uh, accepting an invitation from someone? You should. So it's highly recommended, right? It's highly recommended, as the Prophet sallallahu said in Bukhari, "حق المسلم على المسلم خمس," that the rights. Upon the believers, one to another, are five. What are they? Radu salam, that you reply to the salam. Iyadatul marid, that you visit the sick. Watibaul jinaiz, that you follow the funeral procession to the graveyard. Wa ijabu tu dawa, and that you answer the invitation of the one who is inviting you. Watashmitul altis, and that you reply to the one who, when he sneezes, he says alhamdulillah. So from the rights of the believers upon you. Is that you visit them, that you answer the call to them. When is it more stressed for you to accept an invitation? So there's general invitations, and there's one invitation which is more stressed for you to accept. If there's a wedding invitation, this is the one that it's even more incumbent upon us to try to accept if we can. Sheikh Uthaymin rahimullah taala he mentions some points pertaining to these invitations, though. He says that there can be a situation in the community. Where the scholars of that particular community have identified an individual or group of individuals as those people that should be avoided, due to the sins that they are openly committing in society, 
and due to the false beliefs that they are pushing and teaching in society. So if the scholars of a particular community identify that in a person or a group of people, then these people should be avoided until the ulama of that community say otherwise. Secondly, the consideration is that you have to bear in mind what is going to take place in that place where you are being invited to. If there's going to be things which are contrary to Islam, practices which are contrary to Islam, like singing and dancing, then in this situation, you shouldn't go to that place, except you shouldn't accept the invitation of a people that when you go there, you know there's going to be a lot of evil taking place, like music, dancing, etc., free mixing, except in one circumstance. If you can change the situation, exactly. So if you are able to go there and you have some type of authority, right, where maybe you are the head of the tribe, you can go there and your word is taken to account. Your word is obeyed. Then you can go there because number one, you should accept an invitation. Number two, by you going there, you're going to be able to change the situation of the people there. The third consideration is that the inviter, the person, the person who's inviting you should be a Muslim. Because how do you get this? What was the hadith we just took? Haqqul Muslim ala al-Muslim. That the rights upon the Muslim upon a Muslim, right? Is to accept the invitation. So if a non-Muslim invites you, it's not as stressed. Though you are allowed to, and at times even recommended to visit them. Another thing that you have to bear in mind is that it shouldn't cause you any harm. In the sense that if you are going to go to that invitation, it's going to cause you to leave off something which is more important for you to do. Or it's going to cause you a loss of expenses that you require for yourself or your family. Because sometimes the invitation requires for you to travel. And traveling costs money. And traveling costs from your time. So both of those things may be required by your family. So you have to bear that in mind also. Another very important factor to consider when you have an invite is that is the person to be known a per that he has his income derived from haram sources? Like somebody, for example, works in a non-Islamic bank, an un-Islamic bank. He's dealing in interest clearly. So his income is directly impure. Haram, right? Because he's transacting with uh, riba. So the ulama, they say, then it's not permissible for you to take food which is bought by that money, right? But there is a difference of opinion. Some do say that you can even in that state because the sin is upon the person who is dealing in the transaction, not upon you for eating that food. Because the food in of itself is not haram. It's not haram li dhatihi, it's haram li ghayrihi. It's not haram in of itself, it's haram due to an external factor, which is the income source, right? But in any case, it's better to try to avoid if you, cannot, if you can do so. Tayyip, if somebody is fasting, do they have to accept an invitation? Person is fasting. Said yes, huh? Anybody else? Said no. Tayyip, the Prophet Sallallahu said in Sahih Muslim, إِذَا دُعِيَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُجِبْ If one of you is invited, then he should answer. فَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُصَلِّ And if he's fasting, فَلْيُصَلِّ Anybody understand Arabic? What does yusalli mean? Pray, right? So if he is fasting, then he prays. What does that mean? If he is fasting, then he submits. Salli comes with the meaning of praying, but it also comes with the original meaning, which is to make dua. The original meaning of salah is dua. So here it means to make dua. So if the person is fasting, you attend and you make dua for the person, right? فَإِنْ كَانَ مُفْتِرًا فَلْيَطْعَمْ But if the person is not fasting, then he can go ahead and he can eat, right? Imam Nawi rahimullah ta'ala, he said, of course, if the person is fasting, he has the choice to eat or not to eat, and if it's an obligatory fast, then of course he cannot eat. Once you get to the person's house that you are going to, that you've been invited to, what should you do before you enter the house? You should say, Assalamu alaikum, right? Once it's narrated by Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Aadkhul, can I enter? So the Prophet وسلم, became upset and he told the servant that was with him, uh, 
go to this one, go to this person and teach him how to enter upon the people. And say to him that when you enter upon a people, say, Assalamu alaykum, can I enter? And in other narrations, you should mention your name, that it's such and such person. Because in one of the narrations, the Prophet said, Who is it? And he said, yani, he, didn't, he said, It's me. He didn't give his name, he said, It's me. The Prophet said, Who is me? And tell me your name. So it's imperative that you identify yourself at the door when you are trying to enter. What should be avoided before entering the house? Loud. Exactly. Exactly. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said, Man itala'a fi bayti qawmin bi ghayri idhnihim fahalla lahum an yafqa'u aynahu. That whoever looks into a house of a people without their permission, then it becomes valid for them to poke his eye out, to gouge out his eye. Something so severe, right? To harm somebody to that extent. So you can imagine how harmful and how sinful it is to look into somebody's property without their permission, right? So the person, what should he do when he's standing at the door and he's waiting, or even when the door opens? He should, he should look down, right? Or even better, he should be slightly to the right or slightly to the left of the door, right? Because you never know uh, what's taking place uh, behind the door. The, the women of the household may just be running to the uh, room for where the women are or something, fadl, fadl, take, or something to that extent or that nature. So we should avoid looking once we are entering the house and even when you are entering the house, avoid looking around with beady eyes. Don't be staring at everything, especially in the direction of the place where the person is trying to make you avoid staring in that direction, right? If you know that the women are in a particular section, try not to sit facing that door. Try to sit facing away from that, out of respect for the host. How many times should you seek permission to enter into the house? Three times, huh? Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari, إِذَا اسْتَعْذَنَ أَحَدُكُمْ ثَلَاثًا فَلَمْ يُؤْذَنْ لَهُ فَلْيَرْجَعْ if one of you has sought permission three times and it wasn't given to him, meaning it wasn't heard or it wasn't replied to him, then he should return. However, Imam Ibn Abdul Bar in his book at Tamheed, he says that Imam Malik rahimullah ta'ala said that if you are sure that the person didn't hear you, then you can ask more than three times, right? If you are sure that the person didn't hear you, then you can ask more than three times. One of the um, verses in the Quran pertaining to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, verse 28, If when you are asking permission, right, the person explicitly says to you, I can't attend to you now, yani go away. He says that in a nice way. Then you should go away. You shouldn't stand there trying to climb over his gate or trying to find an open window, etc trying to be insistent of getting into the house. Politely go away. It's the person's right to accept you or not to accept you, right? One of the companions, he said, one of the Mahajirun, he said, my entire life, my whole life, I wanted to implement this verse. My whole life, I wanted to implement this verse, but I was never able to because nobody ever turned me away. That's how they were in that society. But he said, I would have been full of joy to be able to implement this verse. And that's how we should be. If somebody turns you away, don't have something in your heart against this person. You don't know what situation was taking place in the house. Maybe he was newly wed. <laughs> newly wed, right? You got to leave them alone for a long time. Maybe he was in a difficult situation to answer the door. Whatever's taking place, it's his right. So turn away from him in a content situation with nothing in your heart against the person. Why did I knock on his door? I made an effort to come and see him and he couldn't even be bothered to see me. It happened to me once. I was with my wife and... I was in a situation where I couldn't open the door to uh, have the guests in. I think Brother Abdul Sitar might remember. Brothers came to visit me, they even had a cake with them. <laughs> I opened the door a little bit, I took the cake, I said, see you guys later, assalamu alaikum. So alhamdulillah, this is how we're supposed to be. Be easy with each other, right? Situations like this arise at times. Have nothing in your heart against your Muslim brother. Tayyip, it can be that you are seeking permission to enter, but the person is praying. So how does that person who is praying give you permission to enter whilst he is praying? So the Prophet ﷺ said, as narrated by Imam Bayhaqi, 
إذا استؤذن على الرجل وهو يصلي فاستئذانه التصبيح if a person is sought permission to enter upon him but the person is praying then the permission from the person is that he says subhanallah if he says subhanallah while praying then that means you can enter وَإِذَا اسْتُؤْذِنَا عَلَى الْمَرْأَةِ وَهِيَ تُصَلِّي فَاسْتِئْذَانُهَا التصفيق and if a woman is praying and permission is sought to enter upon her then her permitting is that she makes tasfiq, that she claps loudly, right? So subhanallah for the men and clapping loudly for the women. When the host and those who are with him in his gathering, they receive the guest, what should they avoid doing when receiving the guest, if possible? Standing up for the guest, right? It's disliked in Islam to stand up for somebody who's coming upon the group or the crowd or even upon the person. In Bukhari, in his Adl al-Mufrad, he collects that Anas ibn Malik said that there were no people that loved the Prophet ﷺ more than the companions. Impossible. Nobody loved the Prophet ﷺ more than the companions. Yet, when the Prophet ﷺ would enter upon them, they would avoid standing up for him ﷺ because they knew he disliked that, right? So it's imperative to try to implement this sunnah, that do not stand up, for the one who is coming upon you. There are exceptions, and a summary of those exceptions, the ulama, they say that if you think there's going to be some harm entailed in the avoidance of standing up, then it's allowed for you to stand up. So in some cultures, in some tribal areas, it's kind of imperative that you have to stand up for certain people in that tribal custom, or in the custom of that particular area. If you do not stand up for that person, you're in trouble. Okay? People have these strange customs. So in that situation, the ulama, they say, then it's permissible for you to do so. But never in your heart should it be that you are standing up out of magnification for this person, out of ta'zim for this person. It's just standing up out of the respect of the norms of that society that if you cannot avoid, then you will fall into some type of problem. But if people know the sunnah, then you should avoid standing up for the person. Taib, what about um, when you're receiving the guest? You're receiving the guest, we said do not stand, right? Can you hug and kiss the guest? We have a lot of this taking place, right? Can you hug and kiss the guest? If it's your mother, right? Or your father. The Prophet ﷺ said, as narrated by Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, and authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani, narrated by Anas Ibn Malik, قَالَ رَجُلٌ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ رَجُلُ مِنَّا إِنَّ رَجُلَ مِنَّا يَلْقَى أَخَاهُ أَوْ صَدِيقَهُ أَفَا يَنْحَنِ لَهُ a man said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, one of us meets his brother or his friend. Can we bow down for him? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. Bow down, I don't know what that means. And then he, maybe it's just a head, maybe it's a complete bow. Then the, the person said to the Prophet ﷺ, said, فيقبله, Can then the person hug this person and kiss him? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. Then the person said, أَفَيَأْخُذُ بِيَدِهِ فَيُصَافِهُهُ but can we take his hand and shake his hand? The Prophet ﷺ said yes. So in the previous two situations, no, right? The hugging and the kissing or the bowing down, no. But the shaking of the hands, you can do so. Is there an exception to the above rule? Asant, Zakallah khair. The exception is pertaining to somebody who returns from traveling. Right? Imam Ibn Qayyim in Zad al-Ma'ad his famous encyclopedia of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, it said that Imam Ibn Qayyim, this book, Zad al-Ma'ad, which is probably in six volumes in today's print, and it's an encyclopedia of fiqh, hadith, and seerah, etc. And it's like a reference point for any student of knowledge, any scholar. It said that he wrote this on the back of a donkey as he was traveling to Hajj. So just from his head, he's having thoughts and he's writing them down. And it became a, a reference point. SubhanAllah, amazing people. So anyway, this Zad al-Ma'ad, uh, Ibn Qayyim, he narrates in there uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu he used to do this, he used to hug people if they were coming back from a journey and he hadn't seen them for some time. And Shaykh Al-Bani authenticated in his Silsila Al-Hadith, Silsila Sahiha, that uh, Imam Tabarani and al awsat he narrates, he collects this narration where it's narrated, Lama raja'a Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu min hijrat al-habasha that when Ja'far ibn Abi Talib came back from the hijrah, the migration to Habasha, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
that the Prophet Sallallahu hugged him and he kissed him between the two eyes, yani on the forehead, right? So this lucky companion, he was hugged by the Prophet Sallallahu and he was kissed on the forehead. Why? Because he had returned from a journey. So they say this is an exception to the previous rule that we mentioned. So if you haven't seen somebody for a long time, then it's permitted for you to kiss. And again, the previous statement that we mentioned applies here also, that in some cultures, people, they will greet you and they will kiss you on the cheek. So as the person's kissing you on the cheek, don't headbutt him and push him away. Allow him to do so because he will take that as offense, right? So until you are able to teach the community of what is the actual sunnah, don't put people in a really difficult situation by pushing them away. Taib, so the guest has come to you now, he's in your house. And then it's time to eat. Don't be that person who says, are you hungry? Are you sure you're hungry? It's not difficult, I can get you some food. My wife's in the kitchen, she can do it for you. So you're going on and on, and you're making the person feel really, you know, really strange. What am I doing wrong? I thought I was here to eat, <laughs> right? So we shouldn't be of this nature. Rather, the food should be given straight away whenever you find that it's easy for you to do so. Allah mentions in the Quran, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ ضَيْفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ has it come to you the news of Ibrahim السلام, when he had guests? These guests were angels, but Ibrahim السلام, didn't know at that time. So it's narrated in the ayah that Ibrahim straight away, he went quietly and he came back with a calf to give them to eat. So there was none of this communication back and forth. Are you sure you're hungry? It's not a problem. We got food from yesterday. We can give it to you. None of that took place. Straight away, Ibrahim Islam, he went away and he brought out the food for them, making them feel comfortable. Okay? And this is how it should be for the believers. However, when you're feeding your guest, you should avoid something. What should you avoid when feeding the guest? Kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink, but don't be extravagant, right? So today in our societies, in our cultures, it's become a normal. We have to compete with each other. The poor wife, she has to cook four dishes instead of just one. One will suffice. But the poor wife or the poor husband, if the wife is stronger than the husband, is in the kitchen cooking four dishes, right? That's a bit much. The Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, Ta'amu wahid yakfi ta'amu ithnain. That the food of one person suffices two people. Wa ta'amu ithnain yakfi al arba'a. And the food of two suffices four people. And the food of four will suffice, what? Will suffice eight people. So we have to be relaxed when it comes to hosting people. We shouldn't feel that we have to put on a huge spread. If you're able to do so, because you have that uh, level of sustenance, then alhamdulillah. But don't feel that it's incumbent upon you to do so. Whatever is generally accepted as being decent food and a decent amount, then put that forward. So your guest is eating. What if he doesn't like the food? What is the adab here? He shouldn't, say anything. he shouldn't say anything, right? He shouldn't be like, it's happened to me. I've been in a situation, the person's telling me there's not enough food. The person's telling me the food doesn't taste that nice. And I've got a group of, I've got guests. You're embarrassing me, what are you doing? Take me to the side if you want to tell me these things. Not in front of everybody, right? So the mannerisms of the Prophet Sallallahu if he didn't like something, he would just leave it alone. He wouldn't poke at it, he wouldn't bring it to his nose and this is not nice, etc. Right? If you don't like the food, you leave it alone. So kids, especially remember this after your mother has spent a day cooking something for you, don't give her a hard time. Try your best to eat the food and not complain about it. So we refrain from ever embarrassing the host. What should the host himself be careful of doing when eating? Not to finish before his guests. Why? Because it's a way of embarrassing the guest. The guest may feel that he still wants to eat. Okay, I'll say remember this. He still wants to eat. I'm joking. He still wants to eat the guest, right? But what you've done, and well, I'm not making these things up. It happened to me once as well in the brother's house. <laughs> Lovely pizza. Lovely pizza. He took the pizza away from me. I still want to eat. <laughs> That's a bit harsh, right? Don't do that. So eat slowly. Allow your guest to take his time, feel comfortable, relaxed, and then take it away. But to be fair to the brother, he did that because he wanted to give the food to the sisters. May Allah reward him, inshallah. Tayyib, what is the order? What is the etiquette of serving the food? How should the food be served? Is there any etiquette pertaining to that? 
sent from the right, the food should be served from the right, except or unless. So the general rule is to serve from the right. Unless on your left is somebody of importance or like somebody elderly. If there's elderly, the elderly should be served first and everything to the right. That is the rule, right? Elderly first and everything to the right. So the exception would be if there's a, on the left person, somebody who's elder or of high status. So after the food has been eaten, and it was lovely and delicious, inshallah, what gift should you as the guest give to your host? You should give gifts, right, when you visit people. What gift should you give to the host? Wait. <laughs> I know you know it, mashallah. Anybody else? Dua, ahsant. You should make dua for the guest, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ taught in one of the narrations of Sahih Muslim and others that we should say, Allah maghfir lahum, warhamhum, wa barik lahum fi ma razaktahum. Oh Allah, forgive them, have mercy upon them, and give them barakah in that which you have provided them. So this in of itself, apart from the first thing that we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, whereby Allah loves that people visit each other, this is enough as a motivation for us to, want to, have, to have guests at our house, for them to make this dua for us. This dua, if it was answered, can you imagine the effect it will have in your life? That Allah have mercy upon them, forgive them, and increase them in barakah for what you have, from what you have provided them. And there's other narrations also, right? There's many other beautiful du'as that people make when you have invited them to eat, etc. The guest, when they are with their host, they should be wise. They should try to read the situation. If they feel that the, get, that the host is busy, he has something to do, right? Because he keeps running around maybe in and out, then they should take their leave once they have eaten and not stay for too long, right? So people should use their wisdom. You know some people, the dreaded guest, the one when he comes over to your house with the family, they stay for the next six, seven hours. That's a bit too much, right? So we should be very careful and try to read the situation carefully. But of course, if you know for sure that this particular brother loves you to stay as long as you can and he keeps imploring you to stay, then you should stay. Tayyib, also from the rights <coughs> that we have to be careful of pertaining to the host is what is mentioned in the following hadith in Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ummul qawm, aqra'uhum li kitabi ta'ala. That the one who should lead the prayer for a people is the one that has the most knowledge of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنْ كَانُوا فِي الْقِرَاءَةِ سَوَاء فَأَعْلَمُهُمْ بِسُنَّةِ But if they are equal in recitation, then the one who has the most knowledge of the sunnah. فَإِنْ كَانُوا فِي سُنَّةِ سَوَاء فَأَقْدَمُهُمْ هِجْرَةً But if they are equal in sunnah, knowledge of sunnah, then the one who is foremost in performing the hijrah pertaining to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. فَإِنْ كَانُوا فِي الْهِجْرَةِ سَوَاء فَأَقْدَمُهُمْ سِلْمًا But if they were equal in hijrah, then the eldest of them should lead the prayer. But a person should not lead a person in his house or in his place of, of gathering. So if you go to visit somebody, you should not stand up to lead the salah unless the person gives you express permission to do so. Because the one who has the most right to lead the salah is the one who is the owner of the house. And a person should not sit in a designated sitting place, which is for the host, unless he's given permission to do so. So this also teaches us that when you go to somebody's house, don't just sit wherever you want. Ask permission. Brother, is it okay if I sit here? Unless you know the person very well and you know what the norms are and the customary norms are of visiting that person. Otherwise, there's some places that you go to, it's the norm that the head of the household, he has a particular place where he's going to sit. Or somebody may have a bad back, and a particular chair is suitable for him alone, right? So by you taking him his uh, position of sitting, seating, that will cause some problems. Tayyib. If the guest wants to leave, what should take place? You should definitely say salamu alaikum. Before saying salamu alaikum, what should you do? You should ask permission to leave, right? Ask the host if it's okay for you to leave. And that's for two reasons, out of politeness and also because you don't know what's taking place in the house. And so combined with this is that the host should take the guest to the door, should accompany him to the door. Not because you happily quickly want to get rid of them, but because you have to make sure that the guest is not going in the wrong place 
and it's also out of honoring the guest, right? You're honoring the guest by taking him to the front door. And it's imperative that when the guest is leaving that you ask him to come back once again to visit you, even if you didn't enjoy his visitation, if it was difficult for you. We'll stop here, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. As we know, there's much more to these topics, but we're just trying to take a surface level benefit, inshallah. If you have any questions, feel free. Wa jazakumullahu khayla. Naam ya khayla.